the Nets had all gotten together. The owner of the Nets and his wife and Kevin Durant and Rich Kleiman and Sean Marks and Steve Nash, the last two being the general manager and the coach that supposedly Kevin Durant refused to play for or have still on the team if he was going to rescind his trade demand and stay. And they're still there, and so is Durant. So on the Mercedes-Benz Vans phone line to explain this all is none other than Sham Sharani. How are you, sir? Rich, I'm doing well. How are you? I'm doing great. So what happened, man? How how did this genie get put back in the bottle? I, I think a lot of it, Rich, was just the realization from Kevin Durant and the Nets, really, that there was not going to be a trade at the end of the day, at the end of the day, that was going to happen. And so at that point, Kevin Durant was going to be faced with a decision coming up because training camp is just a month away. And if there's no deal, Kevin Durant's going to be faced with the decision. Do I show up in a disgruntled state of mind, kind of pull a Jimmy Butler, James Harden that we've seen over the last two, three years? Or is it going to be one of those things where you have a holdout situation, you know, the likes of Ben Simmons just a year ago. And I don't think Kevin, Kevin, this side has already gotten ugly as, as it is. I mean, it's already gotten personal in terms of the trade request itself was personal. And then the ultimatum that was given to Joe Sy a, a few weeks ago was personal. And just going down that path clearly just wasn't going to be something that either side wanted to stomach. And so it was really just a realization and the eye-opening experience that a deal wasn't going to happen. The best offer I'm told that the Nets had on the table was from the Celtics, Jalen Brown, Derek White, and a first-round pick. And the, the price tag that the Nets had put forth on Kevin Durant, and you know, you, you could say that they might have been even asking for something that they know was never going to be attainable anyway, right? But at the end of the day, when you have a guy that's a 12-time All-Star two-time finals MVP, going to go down in the Hall of Fame, one of the top 15, you know, 12, 20 best players ever, you you have a high asking price. And that price was never going to be met. And I think both sides understood that this is the best opportunity to win a championship. And, Rich, I thought once the season ended, once the Nets were swept on April 23rd, that's when this meeting should have taken place. Because Mm -hmm. there were a lot of, you know, grievances. There were a lot of feelings on both ends that needed to be aired out and, you know, better late than never, uh, you know, but this should have been done months ago. It finally happens now. And um, I I think they, they both sides came to the realization that we need each other. And and, and at this point it's, there's going to be pressure when you go into this next season, but they needed to move past this because the deal just was not going to happen. So uh, the other date in question, Shams is June 30th. That's the date that, Uh, the trade demand by Durant became public and it was just a couple of days after Kyrie opted back in and so many people started drawing a a connected line between those two dots and then we learn that uh, he that Durant wants the general manager and coach out as a condition of his staying and rescinding his trade demand so you use the word disgruntled moments ago what exactly was Durant or is he still disgruntled about? I think just when you look at how this summer has played out, they were swept in in the in the uh, um, you know in the playoffs in the, in round one. That series did not end. That season did not end how everyone expected. And I, I think a level of accountability we saw. You know, Sean Marks, the press conference that he had in mid May, and, and a lot of the the tone of the press conference was about accountability, about, um, you know, resetting the culture, about how the culture might have, you know, worsened or, or might not be what it was a few years ago. Well, the only thing that really changed in the last few years was the arrival of Kevin Durant and Kyrie Irving. So I, I, I don't know how those two guys took it, but that, you know, was something that did occur. Um, and then I, I think you have to look at the Kyrie Irving you know, extension negotiations. And the fact that both sides were not able to get a deal done, Kevin Durant has, um, you know, vocally supported, privately supported Kyrie Irving over the last six to eight months, while I think a a lot of of people have come down on Kyrie Irving. And so I I think you cobble those two things, you know, in this situation. Adam Harrington, uh, an assistant on the Nets staff, who was very close with Kevin Durant, a guy that's known throughout the league as, as a Durant confidant, um, he was fired at the end of the season. Um, and so you, you take all those things to account and just a lack of communication that existed between both sides. And, again, that's something on both sides, right? That's something on, on the player side. That's something on the team side. Because at the end of the day, the only way you're going to get resolutions, the only way you're going to get past moments in life that are tough is through conversation and through a real relationship and through an open forum. And, and 
it took these guys, Rich, two months uh, to get in the, in the same room in a meeting together. Well, actually, actually, more than that, it's May, June, July, August, four months to get in the same room um, and two months since the trade request. So that tells you everything you need to know about where this gulf existed. Sham Sharania here on the Rich Eisen Show, the Athletic and Stadium Senior NBA Insider. Look, I mean, I'm sure you've been involved in negotiations in your career, doing what you do. I have as well. Uh, anytime you agree to something based on the fact that management doesn't give you what you want and presents the reality as a fait accompli, um, it doesn't really uh, sit, sit in well with the person who accepts the fait accompli, and that's Durant. The fait accompli is that we're, we're we're not getting the value that we place on you. You should take that as a compliment, although that prevents you from getting the exit visa you want. And you don't want to hold out. We don't want you to hold out. So let's just, you know, let's just go back together again and let bygones be bygones. Is that really the way it's going to be? Is that the way they're entering the season with this still bubbling beneath the surface? Or was this conversation in Los Angeles airing things out and they really have come to an agreement, and it's all hunky dory. What do you got for me, Rich? I, I I I think it's a little bit of both, and it, and it's it, that's why these things are complex. It's not just a black and white situation. Right. I think this is very very complex. It could be both things. Now, in a perfect world, you know, in a perfect life, I think Kevin Durant clearly would have loved to get traded, and I think the Nets, in a perfect world, um, you know, they they wouldn't have had the restrictions of the rookie designated extension rule that didn't allow them to get a guy like Bam Adebayo or Donovan Mitchell on the roster because they had Ben Simmons on the team. And in a perfect world, the Nets would have gotten teams gutting their roster and giving every last asset like Joe Sy and, and Sean Marks had wanted in any type of a Kevin Durant trade. Um, so that's in a perfect world. But we, as, as we know, Rich, <laughs> the world and life just isn't perfect, especially for a guy like Kevin Durant. He's got four years left on his deal. So a trade like this, if, if this was going to go down – during training camp, before training camp, during the season, it was going to get uglier than what it already was. And that might be tough for the listeners to believe and tough for people to believe, but that's just business. And in the NBA, if, if a guy wants to trade, it's going to get ugly. If a guy on a four-year deal wants to trade, we saw what happened with Ben Simmons. We saw the saga that took place. And I think both sides at the end of the day, Kevin Durant, you know, 33, going on 34, the legacy at the end of the day that he's built, the, the stature that he's built in this league, um, he's going to go down as a top 10 to 20 player of all time. Do you want to put yourself in a position where you're holding out of games? And clearly he did not want to go down that route. And clearly the Nets didn't want him to go down that route. Right. So, I, and, and on the same token, I do think this opportunity, from everything I've been told, they left that meeting energized and ready for next season. I don't think this meeting was Kevin Durant left and he's like, man, I still want to get traded. Like, what the hell? I, I don't think that's the tenor. I know that's not how the tenor of the, that conversation ended. Best you can tell her, he and Kyrie cool? Like, because again, he, he Kyrie returns, and and Durant is, he, he and Rich Kleiman are very astute. He had a no, like, I'm going to ask for a trade, and I know that they're, you know, they, they the, in this day and age, those people like Durant are accommodated because they're Durant. But, they had to know that they could end like this as well. So why would he opt out after Kyrie opts in? Why would that happen? Yeah, I, I think I think you know a couple of things. One, I think yeah, I mean Kyrie uh, Irving and Kevin Durant, um, they they've continued their relationship. You know, the one guy since the NBA season, since the Nets season ended mm -hmm. on April twenty third, the one guy with the Nets that Kevin Durant had remained in communication with from everything I've been told was Kyrie Irving. That was the one guy that he was communicating with on a regular basis. Their you know, but their friendship, that relationship goes beyond just basketball. I think it's more of a life uh friendship that that those two have. And I think there was a decision made uh, you know, throughout this the last four four and a half months that listen, Kyrie Irving had a play option at the end of the day. He had to do what's best for him. Kevin Durant was entering the first year of a four-year extension. He had to do what's best for him. I don't think either of those situations had, you know, I think those were pretty spelled out. Like, mm -hmm. we're going to do what's best for ourselves and each other, um, you know, versus, like, let's figure out, like, how we can – because they've already teamed together once in 2019. That's how they got to the Nets. I think now this is a different situation. Um, and as far as Kyrie Irving, the moment he opted in, I think his mindset just was, how can I make the most of being on the Nets with or without Kevin Durant? 
I think his mindset was focused on being a net. And I think over the last several weeks, you know, ever since summer league and, and the opt-in, I think the Nets and Kyrie Irving from everything I've been told have had positive constructive dialogue. And I think that being a, a backdrop of all of this, I think, you know, at least the Nets have had the stability of Kyrie Irving being comfortable being back in, in any circumstance. Um, so I, I don't think that Lakers scenario was, was really ever on the table um, in a real way once Kyrie Irving opted in. Shram Sharani here on the Rich Eisen Show. So where does Simmons fit in all of this? Is it true um, that Simmons left a text chain that involved a Nets player, a group of Nets players during the playoffs where they asked him to come back for game four and he left the chat room. That's a, a hot story and rumor. Is that true? Did that happen? Best you can tell? That, that, uh, that, that did not happen, Rich. Uh, 100% did not happen. Um, as far as Ben Simmons' future and how he plays in all this, I think he plays a very big role in all this. I mean, at the end of the day, he is part of this big three. He is, there's going to be a lot of hope and a lot of expectations on Ben Simmons this season. He did not play last season. Um, there, there was hope. There was expectation he was going to play in game four in that first round series. He did not play. And so there's a lot for him to prove next season. And from everything I've been told, he has looked apart this summer. He had back surgery in May to uh, fix an issue that's gone on for the last few, few years. And he's made a great recovery from what I'm, from what I'm told. And he's already been cleared for full three on three. In the coming weeks, he's going to be cleared for full five on five, and the expectation, and he's on track to be fully cleared for the start of training camp in in late September. And so, he fits a very big picture in all this. I, you know, when when the Nets made that trade last year, traded away James Harden, Ben Simmons was thought of to be a perfect fit on that team. He's able to defend, he's able to pass, he's able to rebound, ball handled, he's able to do everything that alleviates the pressure from Kevin Durant and Kyrie Irving. And and only time will tell. You know, we can all. You know, I can speak on the information that I have, but at the end of the day, the only thing that will dictate how Ben Simmons, you know, the trajectory of his career is going to be when he steps foot on the uh, on the floor, and that's going to be coming up here in preseason. So just two more questions for you on this, Shams. So couldn't help but notice in the press statement or the the release that came out to confirm from the team what you were reporting that everyone met in Los Angeles and that they're going to continue on and the word partnership was used, and also couldn't help but notice that Durant and Kleiman's brand, the boardroom, had its logo next to the Nets logo, and the word partnership was used. Is am I? Can we connect these dots again and see that the may, maybe part of this conversation was the the Nets were gonna, I don't know, do something with Durant's company or? or production company in conjunction? Why, why use the word partnership and why put his logo on this team? Yeah, I, I, I don't know about the logo aspect. As far as the partnership, I think that that verbiage is, is, is important because I, I do think the last three years, the relationship between Kevin Durant, Joe Sy, Sean Marks, that has been a partnership, right? Like if you're making moves for your organization, you know, as Sean Marks and Joe Sy have been over the last three years, ever since they got Kevin Durant and Kyrie Irving, you want to involve your star players. You know, different organizations do that. When you look at the Lakers, the Clippers, um, you know, the Nets, uh, te- te- teams like that, um, I-, I think that just comes with his stature, and I think it has been a partnership. Now, when did that partnership kind of start to crumble a little bit? Clearly, the last uh, three, four months is, is when that partnership crumbled you know when the trade request was made and the ultimatum was made but now the fact that that verbiage was used again that i i think again re- re-emphasizes that i i, I do from everything I, I i'm i'm told what i believe is those sides left that meeting with with the you know renewed energy a renewed hope of like let's finish what we started and let's see how next season goes. And I, I do think that was genuine. And okay. And that all that said, um, the general sense that I have uh, feel and sense, and I think others will, is in the crucible of a playing season, losing streaks will happen or a timeout will occur that Durant might not agree with or Kyrie might not agree with. There's always disagreements, um, but usually teams can overcome that unless there was something beneath the surface uh, a year prior that required an off season like this and a meeting like the one that happened in Los Angeles to kind of put back in the bottle. 
is this uh, how fragile will this be? Because I think everyone will look at Brooklyn Nets games this year to see body language, to see press conferences, how they're conducted, that um, that trade deadlines might might force action as well. What do you think about that, Shams? I, I, I do believe there's going to be a lot of pressure on the Nets this season. There's going to be a lot of pressure on the players from Kevin Durant um, after the situation, on Kyrie Irving entering the last service deal, Ben Simmons from last season, what happened there, Joe Harris coming back from injury, uh, pressure on Sean Marks, on Steve Nash, on the entire organization. I think from top to bottom, I think that meeting was important because everyone has to be better. So there's no doubt, you know, whatever – you know, word you want to use, whether it's, you know, th- there's going to be a very thin line to this season. No question. When that adversity hits, when you lose games, you know, how will those star players, those stakeholders take it? That's going to be very important. But those habits are going to be built in training camp. And we're going to know, you know, as training camp goes and as that's going along, what the tenor of, of those relationships within those fine lines is going to be. But there's no question. There's going to be pressure on this entire organization uh, really, the moment media day tips off on September 26th. Okay, and last one for you, Omnibus. What's the latest steps for the Lakers? Russell Westbrook, his future. What now that uh, LeBron has signed an extension? What do you think? Um, you know, I, I, I would expect the Lakers to continue to look at the marketplace to make their team better. And you know, I, I don't think there's a concerted effort to moving Russell Westbrook. I think the concerted effort is can we make a, a deal with certain players on the roster with picks that we have to improve this team. And if there's not going to be a deal out there, then I I think this team is pretty comfortable standing pat um, and running it back with Darvin Ham, you know, newly at the helm. But I I think, you know, I I would keep a close eye on guys like Patrick Beverly, Boyan Bogdanovich. um, You know, those are the guys that are still on the marketplace right now that could be available. I I didn't know Beverly was available uh, until, you know, um, he blamed it all on Durant that he's still available. I saw that today. That was great. Did you see that one, Shams? Did you see that one? (laughs) I I, I did. I I think Utah has, you know, a a bevy of guys. You know, we look at Donovan Mitchell, those talks with the Knicks are continuing. Other teams around the league are talking to the Jazz about – about Donovan Mitchell, um, but I think those the, the vets aside from Mitchell, when you look at Beverly Bogdanovich, Mike Conley, Jordan Clarkson, I, I, Malik Beasley, I think all those guys, you know, at, at a certain price tag, are are available. Shams, thanks for the call. Really appreciate it. Uh, I always love picking your brain. Thanks for the time. Look for more of my calls, please. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Rich. Have a good one. The one and only Shams Sharani. I follow him on Twitter. You should as well.